Thank you both for the warm welcome and uh, welcome to all who are here. I want us to just begin by um, connecting with, in whatever way feels authentic, where you are planted on the earth right now, to just connect with the spirit of autumn, um, the darkening of the season, the shortening of the days, perhaps cooler weather. I'm arriving today from Western North Carolina from the mountains, and we just went from 70 degrees last week to 35 degrees today. So I'm here to cozy up with all of you, have the warm sweater and the cup of tea, and I'm glad that we're going to uh, have a little journey into endarkenment. Um, we're an intimate group today, and so I'll allow people to know that the basic structure will be that in a couple of minutes we'll move into some meditation and practice together. I'll share some reflections and we'll have plenty of time for group conversation, for inquiring together, for just looking within to notice um, what is the medicine of darkness that's needed today. Uh, for me personally, as an inquiry from each of you. And we'll take a break about halfway in between our time just to honor our bodies, to stretch and rest, okay? So let's begin by allowing our eyes to rest closed. Bring awareness to Resting in a comfortable position. Just taking a moment to feel your body's connection with gravity. And let's together take in three of the deepest and slowest breaths we've taken today. Allowing the breath to begin to relax you. As your breath returns to its natural rhythm, allow yourself to be softly aware of breath breathing you. No need to become the breather, but allowing your breath to breathe you. And begin to notice how it feels to rest in darkened stillness. Let's notice together that simply by closing our eyes or softening the gaze, some of our other senses awaken, our experience of listening, not just as an auditory experience, but deep listening, tactile listening, awakens. So I invite us to take a minute to simply listen to the internal landscape. Just noticing what's moving through the body in this moment. 
noticing the pace and quality of the mind. Noticing and welcoming any feelings that are here today. Welcoming ourselves as we are. Welcoming the deeper darker undercurrents of our experience. Allow yourself to be equally aware of the outer landscape. Let's take a moment to deeply listen to the field surrounding us. Being curious about where this physical body ends and the world around us begins. Just listening to, sensing, experiencing the sounds and subtle vibrations of the space you're in. The temperature, feeling tone, Perhaps the world, the space outside of the windows and the room sheltering you. And as we continue to rest here together, to settle, I invite you to deeply listen within and out, resting in awareness of the inner and outer landscapes at the same time. Resting in awareness of awareness.
remembering that there is nothing to do or make happen. Nowhere to get to. Nothing to solve or fix or change. And nothing to strive for. So let's soften effort together. And simply be with what is. Welcoming life, welcoming this moment exactly as it is. softening effort. As we rest here together, perhaps noticing the ever-changing nature, thoughts, energy, sensation, Emotion, sound, and perhaps equally noticing that which is unchanging. Awareness itself.
Let's remember together that meditation is not about seeking illumination or transcendence or revelation, but learning to rest, to come home to the dark, empty field from which revelation arises. And so I'd like to guide us as our meditation continues into a short practice for meeting and greeting the darkness with respect and friendship. So let's take in together a couple more deep, full body breaths. Just feeling the air as it enters your body, fills your body, and leaves your body. And I'd like for you to imagine now that you are sitting here next to a window, a window not opening to the light of day, but a window to darkness itself. Imagine the dark vastness of the night sky, the mystery itself, the field of darkness from which we all came and to which we will all return. Just notice how it feels to sit beside this window to darkness and notice you might feel something like the thrill of sitting beneath the night sky sense of possibility. You might notice some fear or anxiety, so please welcome, be with this. Just notice your experience. And I invite us to, if it feels authentic, rest a hand upon your heart for a moment. And to allow yourself to begin to offer loving kindness, compassion, respect, perhaps reverence, directly to the darkness. To the unknown, the unseen, the unformed, the field of all possibility. Some of us are used to sending loving kindness to beings we can see, or know personally, but what does it feel like to direct this towards the darkness itself? And you might also allow yourself to receive 
loving kindness, compassion, from the darkness into your own being. Each and every one of us has an intimate relationship with darkness throughout our lives and beyond. And yet how often do we pause to express our reverence, our respect, perhaps to express our friendship towards the darkness? So just notice what's alive for you in this experience, no right or wrong experience to be having. Noticing if there's anything else for you to give or receive in this moment. And let's take in together one more deep, full body breath. Breathing in and letting go. Right, gently opening your eyes if they're still closed. And welcoming yourself once again to this field. Anyone who has a word or a phrase for just something you received or experienced in that meditation, you're welcome to share it in the chat box. And also if any of you have a particular heart's intention today, something that inspired you or called you to be here. You're welcome to share that in the chat box. So just inviting us to bring our voices in in a quiet way uh, towards the beginning. Okay. And I'll share that today's teaching is celebrating my new book, Luminous Darkness, an Engaged Buddhist Approach to Embracing the Unknown, which came out just over a month ago. Um, As I look in the chat box i see touching fear yes anyone else a word or phrase gentle courage and so darkness invites us into our relationship with fear and courage beautiful to meet the darkness felt a sense of goodness and authenticity deep peace so very diverse experiences yeah soft darkness beautiful pocket of darkness. Thank you. So I'd love to share some reflections and then invite us into a collaborative exploration. Hmm. I think I'll begin by sharing that um, I had no plan to write a book about the darkness and felt a deep calling that I've learned since many others in this time, in this age, are feeling the calling to turn towards rather than away from the darkness, to turn towards the teacher of darkness, to recognize darkness not as the absence of light, which I find so bizarre that even in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, this is how the word darkness is defined, but as a restorative, profound essence within nature and consciousness that is one half of our human experience. Yeah. And so it was quite a synchronicity that 
when I received this calling and soon after went to lead a retreat uh, in Santa Cruz at Land of Medicine Buddha, I had the realization, the recognition that darkness has been my greatest teacher in spiritual practice uh, as, as a female Dharma teacher, as an activist, a spiritual activist, as someone who has uh, long known liminality and the uh, space between the worlds, as someone who's experienced chronic illness, uh, as someone who uh, grew up with parents who were social justice activists with whom I watched and witnessed the profound indiscrepancies in our societies from a young age. Darkness, from what I can tell within the dominant paradigm, is deeply and profoundly misunderstood. And our practice invites us, as I shared during our meditation, not to uh, attempt to attain illumination, to transcend the difficulties of our human experience or that which makes us uncomfortable, to turn away from shadow, or to label anything through the binary perception lens but to learn to rest in the darkened stillness, the luminous darkness, the fertile emptiness from which revelation arises, yeah? And so as I begin teaching about this book and sharing these teachings with so many diverse audiences, I've been met by this beautiful, beautiful hunger that really lifts my heart, oh, wonderful so many beings in this moment in time feel a readiness a ripeness to bring more respect and reverence to this darkness that is one half of our existence here are people with me and so i want to begin by um just going back to a story many of us know well of gotama buddha and the story of the rose apple tree, that, that just at the time when the Buddha was in the thick of his aesthetic stage of the path, this very uh, body punishing, rigorous, treacherous attempt to somehow get to the light, the Buddha had a memory drop in. And this memory was simply of being a young boy resting peacefully under the shade of the rose apple tree. And what the Buddha remembered in a visceral, visceral and deep way was the spontaneous dropping in to absolute peace in the darkened stillness and the maternal embrace of this tree. And that this peace, which he called nirvana, had not a thing whatsoever to do with trying to be the solo heroic spiritual warrior. It had nothing to do with effort or push or punishment. It had nothing even to do with discipline. It had everything to do with his willingness to rest and to surrender to the already awakened state. And it was the restorative darkness of this tree, this generous tree, which reminded him of such. Yeah. And so let's talk for a minute about symbolism. I shared that in the dominant paradigm, we tend to think of darkness as the absence of light. And let's just pause each and every one of us and reflect on the unimaginable harm that this um, misunderstanding, that this chosen definition, that this bias that we then hold towards light against dark has held within human history. Uh, this could be our entire topic today, but it's going to be simply our starting point, acknowledging that that 
seed of that binary perception which perceives light as superior and darkness as inferior has led to and been caused by a profound disconnect from the natural world, from Mother Nature, a profound disassociation from our bodies, racism, xenophobia, classism, ableism, sexism, and misogyny. We could go on and on and on when we touch into the profound harm that this duality has created. Yeah. When we look inside, and I want everyone to look inside yourself right now, and just to consider in your own life any ways that this collective assumption and misunderstanding, this hierarchical perception which has perceived light as the place to get to and dark as something to push away, the ways it may have impacted first your relationship with yourself, your relationship with the whole wilderness within which create which contains the full spectrum of light and dark just a show of hands if you're aware perhaps painfully or tenderly aware of the ways that this uh, false divide has impacted how you have related with you let's acknowledge the ways it's impacted how we have related with or perceived others and i don't have to point out in this country that we're experiencing a moment of the greatest divisiveness um, we ever have in uh, the United States. And so again, a show of hands, if we can just notice the ways it's impacted at times, a perception of uh, the unknown or different as other, yeah. And uh, this one might take a little bit more looking, but how about with the, um, the natural world itself, acknowledging that darkness reminds us of the innate value of the slow, the invisible, the still, the fallow of winter, the restorative aspect of being, and yet through capitalism, colonialism, individualism, we find ourselves in this moment in time when speed, productivity, the bright lights of human busyness have our attention and have grabbed our attention in quite a violent way. Show of hands again, if you know just what I mean, and you can even perhaps touch in with ways you too <laughs> get impacted by that, get influenced by this. And so I want to remind us all of the intersubjective nature of conditioning that even if we um, are deeply paying attention to our own the conditioning the limitations of the messages we've received from family society media uh, trauma so that we can allow to dissolve conditioning to return more fully to our home and original consciousness, yeah, return to source as A. H. Dogen, the 12th century founder of Soto Zen names. We're still navigating a world where whenever there is shared conditioning, perhaps shared by our friends or communities, perhaps shared um, and unnamed within our sanghas sometimes, perhaps shared by leaders, we can't always see the water in which we swim, right? So this is a time for all of us. One of the, the beauty, the, the beautiful aspects of this, these times, and also something that um, calls me to tears sometimes, being alive in this age when we are collectively waking up to so many unconscious biases that have been long held. And Today, I'm going to invite us to both investigate some more of these unconscious biases as relates to light and dark, and also to touch together the medicine of darkness throughout history across the globe. There have been spiritual traditions and societies which have recognized darkness as an incredible teacher, as the instigator of all spiritual growth. 
Humans have seeked out darkness actively, going to spend time on darkness retreats or meditating in caves. And humans have spent time communing together under the dark night sky. It is phenomenally recent, folks, that we've had the electricity to actually avoid one half of nature in its physical existence. Uh, it's really only in the last 50 to 100 years that we've had the kind of access to electricity that we don't simply, when night descends, experience the darkness of the night. And I don't know about you, but I've uh, for a long time been aware of the poverty this causes, the depth that we miss out of. When we don't physically engage, I feel the same way about lack of physical engagement with the soil, with the earth, but when we don't physically engage with the night sky, what do we forget about humility, about reverence, about curiosity, about all possibility, about our place here beyond the anthropocentric world which focuses on, uh, as Tibetan teacher Andrew Holacek points to awake centric existence, this kind of message that the human world that we've created with social media and computers and bright lights and the who I am in the daytime, that that's what's real, that that's what's to focus on. And to consider all that gets lost when we forget the darkness from which everything arises. So all of light arises from darkness. All creativity, all vision, every insight you have ever had, every possibility arises from this fertile, always existing field of darkness. And our practice invites us <laughs> not to choose one over the other. It invites us to remember that this is a path of surrendering to the fertile darkness, of learning how to live in celebration, I would say, of the dynamic interplay of light and dark. And just consider that both the spiritual path and global uncertainty invite us to navigate darkness and the unknown. And I think this is why more and more people than ever before are beginning to open their hearts, to feel their hunger, to uh, embrace the darkness. So consider that it's our original nature to celebrate the spectrum and the interplay of dark and light, night and day, receptive and expressive, yin and yang, emptiness and fullness naturally exist in dynamic balance together, right? And this can be difficult to grasp from binary perception, which continually insist on this or that instead of this and that, right? There's a quote I've always loved by A. Hey Dogen, again, the founder of Soto Zen. And this is from the Song of the Precious Mirror Samadhi. And he says, light and darkness are a pair, like the foot before and the foot behind in walking. Each thing has its own intrinsic value and is related to everything else in function and position. And as one studies that teaching, there's a lot that comes out around the balance of receptivity and expression, as I already named, yin and yang, listening and action. How many of you have, um, I might say, celebrate in your own way, to your own extent, wherever you are on the path, this invitation to this balance that perhaps your meditation practice has ignited. Yeah. So again, 
any conversation about darkness invites um, us to recognize the connecting points between physical darkness and symbolic metaphoric darkness. When we look to the natural world, we see that for all of biological life on earth, darkness is equally valuable and important to the light. We acknowledge that there are myriad life forms that are solely dependent on darkness, nocturnal plants and animals. We recognize that the human endocrine system is dependent upon uh, time spent in darkness. And yet we're experiencing this age of the overlighting of planet Earth. Over 60% of planet Earth now artificially lit at night, over 90% of the US and Europe. That's immense. And in my book, I've written quite a bit about a connection that I see between the overlighting of planet Earth and the overlighting of human consciousness. And I'm just curious how many of you see in your own way. I know I'm talking to a group of people, uh, many of whom are in San Francisco or the Bay Area. So I think you might agree with me as I share this obsession or fixation, or we can call it an addiction to speed, getting somewhere, doing, filling space, more is better, faster is better. These are all expressions of marketplace mentality. Yeah. And yet, though we can even bring those messages to our meditation practice, a sense that I am trying to get somewhere or trying to attain enlightenment, when we begin to settle, we recognize that part of our misunderstanding has been this assumption that effort, mental effort, is a requirement in everything mental effort isn't it that we assume it's a requirement on the spiritual path even in sitting meditation we assume it's a requirement in doing life instead of emptying and allowing life to do through us or to use us Again, because we're a small group, I'll ask for a show of nods. How many of you can resonate with some of this um, unconscious assumption that mental effort is required? It's part of what I sometimes describe as humanity in our confusion, thinking that the mental domain is our center of gravity instead of coming down into our bodies, down into our connection with the earth, down into our pelvis, our sacral center, as center of gravity and learning, relearning, because it's a remembering, it's nothing new, how to engage with all of life through a deeper source of knowing, right? Direct experience. I remember years ago, my Zen teacher said, and I had to sit with this for a little bit. If I didn't have another thought in life, I would be all the more better. She was talking about how the more she sat, the more her thoughts simply dissipated and she found herself guided, as many of you can relate to in your own way in practice, by something deeper, by direct experience, by actual knowing, <laughs> rather than a mental replacement for knowing, yeah? I'm touching many different aspects of darkness in our reflections right now. In the book, I present darkness as a multifaceted jewel, acknowledging that in my experience, it is such a profound teacher. <laughs> Again, a teacher in slowing down a teacher and remembering our ability to perceive our relational intelligence through which we can perceive from the heart beyond the domain of the visual field and a habit of actively using our eyes and actively here's the mental effort again assessing judging labeling comparing everything that we see 
sorting life out mentally through hierarchical perception rather than seeing from the energetic center that perceives wholeness because it is wholeness, right? In this book, Luminous Darkness, one of the topics I touch on is uh, the need in today's world as we're navigating collective uncertainty. And as so many of us have a conditioned fear of the unknown, a need to learn to lead in the dark, and be led by the dark. What this means for me as a teacher is a need for more of us to learn to set down our script, to release our agenda, to show up open, naked is the metaphor I use, in order that we can actually co-create moment by moment, collaborate, uh, trust the guidance that comes through beyond a tendency to want to control life because we just find it more comfortable, okay? And so I've shown up today with without any script, uh, without any agenda, here to see what the group field needs and what the group field brings. But as I'm uh, listening to my own reflections right now, I'm finding myself wanting to uh, invite us in a few minutes into breakout rooms and to invite a little bit of personal reflection with a couple questions that I'll give us. And when we come back, we'll have plenty of space for reflection and for questions, sharing and going deeper. But what I'd like to ask is first, is there anyone here, if you could let me know in the chat box, if you're unable to join a breakout room, if anyone feels an intimidation factor of joining a breakout room or just, ah, oh, this is my hibernation Sunday and now you're asking the introvert to come out, no fear. <laughs> I'll be inviting this practice in such a way that uh, I believe both introverts and extroverts and anyone in between will enjoy it. <laughs> you don't have to join video either. You can absolutely join audio. But um, I'm not seeing anyone voice that in the chat box. So maybe I'll invite uh, Gnome to go ahead and just create the rooms while I invite some reflection. Um, let's see. So we'll, we'll do groups of two. And let's just say that if yeah, I think groups of two will work. Okay, so you're going to meet another human in just a moment. And maybe just for fun, uh, find out which of you has the longest hair. Yeah, we'll have long hair person speak first in this share. And as it will begin, you'll just have an opportunity to reflect on these questions that I'm going to ask and to, to notice which feels alive for you, which would you want to speak to? Maybe you want to speak to more than one. But the first is just, as I talked about this very popular collective bias, yeah, trying to get away from the dark and get to the light. And are there any ways that this has impacted your, your spiritual practice, your meditation path, perhaps in the past? I could share volumes about how early in my practice I tried so hard to be the perfect meditator who was going to cut off and dismember my shadows and without even recognizing that those very shadows were sacred messengers calling me forth into greater power, not power over, but shared power, greater embodiment. And we'll talk about that more when we come back. Or perhaps any ways that you're aware that this uh, fear of darkness as the unknown, okay, uncertainty, the mystery, uh, still impacting your life and your being 
and today, just to notice what's arising for you around this. And I think it would be uh, fine to simply have about, oh, five minutes each to share, so 10 minutes total. The way I like to encourage sharing in breakout rooms is just the person going first will speak while your partner just listens. And as I named in the meditation, to think of listening as tactile listening, not just auditory listening, but listening through our whole bodies, just receiving, actually no effort really required. <laughs> awareness is already listening. So just rest in awareness. And then you'll switch and the other person will get a uh, chance to share while you listen. Any questions? friends. Just take a minute and look within. Yes. No. Yeah, just to say if uh, you get to your room and no one else shows up, just come back and we'll we'll figure out like two of us will go one of us will go with you or something just because the numbers are saying. small. And, yeah. We've already lost a couple, I think. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> things can happen sometimes right, when one right, invites right. breakout rooms. Yeah. Uh, and so we'll just go with the flow here. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that, Noam. Okay. All right. So it's about 57 now. Yeah. Let your body land here. Just connecting again with body, breath, a sense of feeling supported by the earth below the ground below. And I'd like to go ahead and open the field for a chance to hear some of your reflections, some of your questions. I want to first just read one more written in the chat box that um, that I found significant. Uh, recognizing it says that the voice inside that goes, wait till you get to know the real me, then you won't like me, is core shame. And just curious for a, a show of hands of how many people can relate at some point in your life or now to that that voice and that kind of dualistic, uh, conditional love that says these parts of me and we, we label them, we'll let them be seen, we'll let them into the light, right? But we'll put these other parts away in the dark, hoping no one sees them. So one of the things we can think about with darkness is how we've learned, instead of learning to recognize and celebrate the full spectrum of light and dark, within ourselves and our world. We've learned to judge and label that which makes us uncomfortable or that we haven't yet integrated or that we don't understand as dark. And then we push it away into a place where it in fact cannot enter sacred alchemy with the light, right? Where it is not brought into healing. When I read that on the side in the chat, I was reminded of um, a sweet story from when I first met my husband or the first time my husband and I sat down. I met him at a conscious dance gathering class that he was facilitating and we decided we wanted to connect. And the first time we sat down to connect and dropped in together into conversation. I remember at some point he said, you know, I just really don't like the whole dating thing. It's got this sense of like, maybe this person is going to really like me at first, but once they find out about mm hmm or that or that thing over there, it's just going to go downhill. He's like, can I just find that tiring? It's just exhausting. And I remember saying to him, you know, I'm so curious, like, 
I'd love to hear you name that list. What are those things for you that they might not see at first and we'll see later? And he looked across at me and he's just open and transparent and he named the entire list, all the things, you know, all the shadows. And it was in that moment of just uh, watching him talk about his shadows so openly that I completely fell in love with him. <laughs> no turning back after that. That was it. And, um, you know, just an encouragement, a reminder for, for all of us, yeah, to be really mindful about what we're pushing away to the side or hoping others won't see. And uh, again, letting ourselves be seen as we are. Yeah. 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 So, so questions, reflections, what's feeling alive for you in this conversation? Yeah. Katie, See the hey. first hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm super psyched to be here. I was joking in my breakout room. I was like, this is super resonant with where my practice is right now. And I'm really glad I'm here. And then I was like, oh, right. I kind of had to be here, but I, I would have been here anyway. <laughs> um, one of the things that's been really up for me just in the last month is the, um, the kind of like interpenetrating nature of the light and darkness. Like you really can't have one without the other. And the, the kind of insight that the extent to which I was resisting the darkness is the extent to which I was like limiting my experience um, and the extent to which I can like frictionlessly be with what feels, what feels like the dark side of things is also the extent to which I can experience like safety and openness um, and like connection. And by like limiting my experience of the darkness, I'm also limiting my experience of everything else. Um, and so that was like an insight that, that I came up in the breakout rooms that uh, feels like good to share. It's a huge insight. It's an important insight. By limiting my experience or my integration of the darkness, I'm limiting my experience of everything else. So darkness and the term I use is endarkenment offers a path to wholeness. We cannot experience and know our wholeness if we are pushing away one half of existence. We cannot. And a couple of the ways I might speak to this that you can each touch through your own life experience. One is, which was just pointed to, um, there's a way in which we, through pushing away or fearing the dark, fearing shadow, we are also pushing away and avoiding a recognition of who and what we are as as vast as all of life. We are pushing away our true size in a sense. In other words, we're playing it small. So sometimes when we first come to practice, we're like a tiny clay vessel and we're comfortable with some emotions, but uncomfortable with a bunch and comfortable with some of our selves being seen, but and then that begins to open and it begins to soften and we begin through simply welcoming and being with what is it begins to open larger. But we are invited to know ourselves as vast, limitless, all possibility. We're invited to know ourselves as far more resilient, which is the nature of the human heart than we have ever been taught because the uh, rubble of a conditionally loving society, uh, a society that's cre been created through the illusion of conditional love, is not going to recognize how vast and vibrantly alive we actually are. Does that resonate with people's experience? One of the things I would remind people is that, and I talk about this in the book, um, grief and compassion are two sides of the same coin. And if we're pushing away our grief, if we're not willing to metabolize our personal and our collective grief, then we are pushing away love and compassion and also the joy that is who we actually are. So how many of you here have had the experience of upon embracing a shadow that maybe you held shame about, or maybe you thought, 
was uh, different than anyone else. And I'm so uh, judgmental that I hold this. And when you finally embraced it, finding yourself living in an entirely new dimension of aliveness, of energy, show of hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and once you've experienced that once, you're kind of onto it. Oh, okay. Well, then maybe this other shadow doesn't actually mean I'm shit. Maybe this other shadow is actually something worth beginning to embrace. And that doesn't mean it's it's necessarily then just easy the next time. <laughs> Sometimes it takes some embodied alchemical work, but the truth is our bodies are vessels for this alchemy. This is what we are here for. Our earth bodies are here for this. So thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, <laughs> I, I've been on a number of different um, podcast interview since my book came out. One that I love so much with Tenzin, who is here with us today, another uh, extraordinary Dharma teacher. And there was one conversation um, where I was talking to someone who was quite resistant, at least at first, about the notion of darkness as teacher. And I talk in the book about uh, what I call a culture of sun shining, a cultural habit of trying to just keep it light, keep it surface. Um, let's recreate. Let's just focus on what's comfortable and diminish what's not. And this individual was a little bit locked in sunshining. <laughs> and so in our conversation that we had, it was so fun to invite that person into just a little bit of inquiry to, to recognize simply that the habit of sunshining actually when this person looked a little deeper felt draining it actually felt effortful it actually was something that this person had been taught or had been modeled for this person but it really did mean uh, constant work because if we are uh, rigidly holding on to these labels of light as what we're trying to get to and dark as what we're trying to push away and then we have to constantly be monitoring and this is how i feel about the duality of positivity versus negativity we have to be actively scanning the field is this a positive emotion okay negative emotion oh no how what do i do give me the 10 steps to get rid of negative emotions um we have to be actively monitoring and if we are instead committed to recognizing the sacred of all of life again i'm going to repeat myself the full spectrum of light to dark to everything in between this actually doesn't require extra energy this is a motion of resting in shared presence and being with what is inviting what is into the already existing circle of acceptance yeah briefly on that during the break i got out one of my favorite poems about darkness which is in the book and i'll share that when i first uh, announced to one of my teachers and mentors uh, joanna macy who some of you might know who's in her mid 90s now she walked over to her bookshelf I covet her bookshelf. It's just a lifelong decades collection of extraordinary books. And she pulled out Rilke's The Night. And so just to listen for a moment. You, darkness of whom I am born. I love you more than the flame that limits the world to the circle it illuminates and excludes all the rest but the dark embraces everything, shapes and shadows, creatures and me, people, nations, just as they are. It lets me imagine a great presence stirring beside me. I believe in the night. So we will thank Rilke for that. Yeah. 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 And so just keeping the space open, noticing 
Who else feels willing to bring your voice in? Just resting together and see what arises. Yeah, Angela. I can't hear you just yet. Let's make sure you're unmuted and address that first. Okay, there I am. Okay, um, you know, I, as you read the poem, the image in my mind of a dragon sitting in the darkness, that, that image came in my mind and then the dragon just vanished. And that dark space was not, not frightening anymore. I, I don't know where the image of the dragon in the darkness showed up, but it did. And, and at the end of the poem, it was just darkness and nothing, no dragons. Beautiful, beautiful, Angela. Part of what I hear in that, um, the phrase that arises for me is uh, that darkness reveals wholeness, the already existing wholeness, and how often when we're perceiving in the domain of daylight, again, thinking of, especially in today's world, um, the connection we sometimes make with using our eyes in an active way and overusing the mind of discrimination. It's labeling, it's saying this, a separate from that. It's uh, judging and assessing what it's labeling. It's busy, busy, busy. <laughs> but that dragon is sometimes what we perceive through this labeling mind that's really projecting rather than seeing clearly. And then the night drops in and this blanket of darkness covers everything, reminds us of the interconnected field of everything and some of those lines that we've drawn around certain uh, perceptions that we're projecting are able to dissolve and we get to instead rest in the dark, spacious, accepting nature of the heart. Does that resonate with your imagery a bit? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's really interesting because, you know, we're all asked no matter who we are, no matter what walk of life to navigate the unknown, to navigate that which we can't understand, to navigate uncertainty. It's part of being human. It is core to the spiritual path, letting go of the familiar shore without yet seeing where we will land and it's core to today's age of uncertainty. And yet still not many people have been skillfully invited into training for opening our hearts to the unknown. And again, for turning to this, we might call inner compass or way of navigating beyond the conditioned mind, which just labels and assesses and wants to control. So there's a real opportunity today as we have to navigate the unknown. I also want to offer one more piece that was inspired by the dragon, and it's this. And it goes back to um, what was shared earlier, that there's a section in the book called The Verdant Cavern of the Underworld. The Verdant Cavern of the Underworld. If we have been conditioned to sunshine, to keep things surface and light, or to avoid the deeper, darker undercurrents of our experience. We are avoiding power. We are avoiding life force. We are avoiding eros. We are avoiding love. We are avoiding, again, when I say power, I'm speaking of shared power or power with rather than power over. And what we are getting through this avoidance is disassociation, 
numbness, a deeper cutting ourselves off from the earth and from the body as vessel for the divine. We are stepping into great confusion through this avoidance. And so we learn in practice how much gets restored <laughs> when we're willing instead to turn towards this Verdant Cavern, right? To welcome it and to welcome it in others. Who else would like to bring your voice in? Any questions or reflections that might uh, help you today to name in this field? Yeah, M Malik. Yeah, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Cool. Earlier, I was in a cafe and the introductory meditation, I had my eyes closed and there was a really horrifying element to that of being in a public space with my eyes closed. And um, um, since then, it kind of occurred to me that, and after a while I felt comfortable as I you know, relaxed into it, but it occurred to me that there's a voluntary aspect to the light, dark duality because we can close our eyes and suddenly there's this darkness. But while I had my eyes closed in the cafe, I, and you, you kind of alluded to this in about our other senses coming to life, I could hear so much and smell so much. And it, it seemed like there's no equivalent to, to sound and smell and touch because there's never really a silence, right? There's always some some sound, there's always some smell, there's always some feel in, on my skin. And so I just was wondering about that, the darkness being um, something that's sort of, something we can step into, something that's voluntary in some way, whereas the other senses are kind of just pouring in um, all the time. Thank you, thank you, beautiful investigation. And I would also encourage you to be curious that perhaps it's also an assumption that the other senses are just pouring in all the time, to which I'm just pointing to that place that um, we access through direct experience. We drop into darkness and we drop into stillness to varying degrees in our practice. And at times we drop into the divine darkness or the divine stillness, this field, which is so still, we're not even so much perceiving through those senses anymore. Um, that a deeper quiet descends. Uh, so just to be curious about that, Malik, and then to your point, I think it's a really important point that we have choice around choosing darkness and, and around softening our visual field. And two ways that I love to invite people into that. Number one, just the practice of softening our gaze in ordinary everyday life more often. So I come from the Zen tradition. So was taught to meditate just with a soft gaze, but recognize when I was first taught that, oh my gosh, I'm so often using my eyes in an active way. And when I can practice this soft gaze, which means my eyes are just resting in their sockets, there's no doing or activity required. I can practice this when I'm with someone, when I'm on a walk, not so much when I'm doing something that requires attention to detail in a certain way, but I can practice this state and notice the entire physiological shift in my system. Yeah. So that's one encouragement. And another is to really take on, yes, as you're pointing to Malik, physical darkness as a practice. Uh, I personally 
engage in darkness retreats from time to time, which some of you might have. But I want to remind us that wherever you are, whatever time of day it is, just hours ago, you were encircled by a field of pure dark. And just hours from now, you will be again encircled by this field. And we can pause, as I like to, throughout the day, perhaps close your eyes to just imagine. You can do this right now. To close your eyes and just to imagine the physical darkness encircling everything, to imagine the presence of darkness, reminding you of possibility, all possibility, the possibility of every moment alongside what we get caught in when our eyes are open, what I see is real and set and fixed, set in stone. Uh, we forget the choice we have in every moment. So just to maybe ask for a show of nods for people with me on that, just the power, remembering physical darkness, the presence of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a beautiful inquiry, Marie. Thank you. Yeah. Who else? Just notice. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I'm what's really coming up for me now and has been uh, really big lately for me is um, I'm just just making a stronger connection between my, well, when I started practicing, uh, kind of what motivated me to start practicing and some of the first insights I had in practice had to do with my, uh, I always use the word honesty, like my real being, my honesty in what I say and how I show up with other people and with myself. And that has been, um, uh, you know, incredibly fruitful and insightful and sometimes really hard. And more recently, I've started to be able to inquire more deeply like I can, I, the the times when I am not really being honest, and I'm not talking about like, you know, out and out lying, but just sort of being actually truthful with myself about what is going on or with others, it's become so much more um, uh, intense and like uh, un, unavoidable. Like it's not like, oh, I'll realize the next day that this thing I said was not, you know, wasn't aligned with how I really was feeling. It's more like it'll like happen in the moment and it's like in my face. And I've really uh, started making connections between that and the selfing and the sort of defended, you know, like, well, why did I do that? What am I who who is the me that I'm trying to shore up with this with this you know obfuscation and so that's what's really coming up for me that's uh that's this is bringing up I'm not exactly yeah. sure how it connects to darkness I mean I know how it does kind of metaphorically uh and then uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that but then also that the the image that the, when, when you had to sit by a window with darkness on the other side, I just had this very beautiful image of like the darkness that was on the other side was also like enveloping me in this circle. That was really, really a beautiful image. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Noam. And there's a couple of things I'm hearing and what you're sharing. One I'm hearing you simply point to, and I imagine everyone can touch this through their own experience, that 
habit of selfing, which let's acknowledge for a moment how much energy that takes, um, maintaining this sense of separate self, making what's arising, what's happening mean something about me, taking life personally, uh, inserting our self, <laughs> our small self into the moment. It, it takes a lot of energy. And then I hear you acknowledging uh, equally how much energy, though this isn't the language you use, this is part of what I heard in it, it takes when you notice. So there's this habit of some sometimes catching yourself in a not, not anything big, but a moment of dishonesty with yourself and the relationship that and defending the self. So all this activity, all this doing, all this energy that we give at times to the small self, inserting the small self, defending the small self, covering up for the small self, cleaning up for what the small self just got into, like all of that. And um, perhaps there's a connection in this conversation with darkness because through bringing more and more of ourselves into um, the dark there's a deepening of just being able being willing to perceive through the heart i want to pause and just acknowledge that i'm not necessarily talking about the heart as an organ even though it is a highly intelligent organ but but the heart of our being yeah this deeper center of perception and this is a place of acceptance it's a place of acceptance and welcome and acceptance and welcome uh, these don't require energy it's just the nature of compassionate awareness itself so the more and more and more we're willing and we know it takes courage it takes courage to set down the the selfing and the defending the self and the and that cleaning up after <laughs> the self and just bring more and more of ourselves into acceptance right and rest more in the acceptance as uh, so a recognition that this is who and what we actually are at a deeper level the more we get to live in uh, what i would call a regenerative way uh, there's simply more more restoration it feels regenerative how many of you are aware in whatever way this speaks to you of the level of depletion that all of the habits around the separate self <laughs> require it's it's depleting isn't it really depleting and um let's also acknowledge just our world today and the level of collective depletion again from the collective self, the depletion of othering, of divisiveness, of resisting life, of all of it. We are collectively profoundly depleted. So to simply acknowledge the invitation or medicine of darkness as a restorative field, we, we all need rest. I think desperate for rest as a collective. And maybe there's a way that um, these teachings and that also this season coming upon soon, the winter solstice, and can give us all a little more permission or reminder from the natural world for rest. So I see another hand. Let's see if I'm saying your name properly. Is it Charles Lee? You've got it. Yep. Great. Welcome. Hi, thank you, thank you, um, and, and uh, yeah, this is such a such a nice group. I meant to make it on time, but uh, didn't happen. I'm in, in in New Mexico, so I'm actually an hour, I think, an hour ahead. So I think I just got my times messed up. But um, yeah, to hear everybody share, um, what comes up for me is. Uh, The idea of, I guess I've had this just throughout my entire life of, uh, you know, not being comfortable with, with conflict or with like, just, I don't know, like criticism 
um, uh, whether it's uh, delivering it or accepting it, um, like this people pleasing and codependency, I think of like, uh, uh, well, if, if you're not okay, then like, I'm not okay. But, but like the only reason I'm not okay is because you're not okay. Like if only you would be okay, then, 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 God, and then everything would be easier on me. Um, and that would lead to like, not, you know, not using my voice, not speaking up, um, you know, kind of retreating and, uh, uh, you know, I've been I've been practicing mindfulness, studying Buddhism for the last three or four years, and um, and yeah, it's it's so right when 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 kind of accepting. I guess I've been been able to kind of accept some of those, like like sometimes like or, or just yeah, being able to kind of accept criticism but not identify with it, um, to. Um, yeah, to, I guess to understand, yeah, that not everything, yeah, that 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 sunshining comment you made, that not every, you know, life isn't just about stringing like nice experience after nice experience, um, and it's been, um, it is, it is freeing when I'm able to get to that, uh, to that place. Um, but yeah, a lot of my practice now is, is, is. Uh, I feel like I've peeled away a lot of the the superficial parts of the onion, and uh, yeah, I'm in that core. You know, really looking at that core of 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 shame that uh, that 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 I certainly you know that I certainly have identified with. Um, you know, I have this. Uh, uh, I don't know. I like. I you know. I, like to think of myself as like very clever creative person but that has I've done some very unskillful things with that creativity or cleverness um but now I also realize there are you know there are some wonderful and beautiful things I you know I've, I've done with that um I've also I would also really get self-conscious about being like an introvert or being aloof or not being like super emotional or reactionary. Um, but even as I'm thinking now, it's like, for me, like equanimity practice has been quite, quite easy. I have to come from the other end of like apathy. And if I just maybe care a little bit, then I can get it, you know, equanimous rather than being so reactive and having to drop reactivity and all of that. So. Oh, no, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I want to really appreciate your honesty and transparency and openness. And, you know, for all of us, and we're, we're just to, that I'm touched by everyone's honesty and openness and shares because um, there's a field of reciprocity in awakening. And we, when we are honest and transparent, and when we're vulnerable, this is contagious to those we're with, and it reminds us all of the strength in our vulnerability. But when you were talking, just a couple of quotes I was reminded of from the book that I deeply love, and I want you to have them so you can sit with them. And the, the first is a quote by a woman named Barbara Taylor Brown. She says, there is no darkness to God. The night is as bright as the day. And just reminding us to investigate how incessant the habit can be of looking within, let's start there, and just labeling this is good and this is bad. Instead of learning to, I'm going to go back to that phrase, perceive with the heart, drop into, and this is what our practice is, dropping into and stabilizing our recognition of compassionate awareness as who and what we are. This field never, ever, ever leaves us. We only leave it and we're remembering in practice how to stay home, we might say, 
And while the separate self might have been conditioned to try to sunshine or seek a high or an elevation or a false idea of happiness as coming from externals, uh, there is always within us a steadfast awareness that lives in peace. And this is the uh, reclaiming we're engaging in our practice to remember this field. So every time, as you just pointed to, and I'll just, we get to turn towards and be with discomfort. Every time we get to, we find ourselves in conflict and we're like, oh, this is just a big mirror for the people pleaser who hates conflict. Every time an emotion comes up that we find really hard to be with, if we can just take that first step, just gentle with compassion, turning towards and being with just a little longer, allowing a little more space around it, we begin pretty rapidly in practice, okay? to remember who and what we actually are, to remember this field that actually is not bothered and that is not labeling. And so this brings me to one more quote, and this is from the Kashmir Shaivas tradition. Um, there is no darkness within, only light unseen. Within each and every one of us is the great Eastern sun that never sets. And I think these are both quotes we could spend some time with, but we're towards the end of our linear time together. So I just want people to sit with those, yeah? And to take them home. All right. So I'd like to invite us to pause and I'll dedicate the merit. I think there might be a couple of announcements before we end our time together. All right. Let's put our palms together. And just close the eyes once again, taking in a couple of deep, full body breaths. Let's first appreciate uh, our collective willingness to step into the mystery together today, to come together open-hearted and curious, even if it was also alongside fear or doubt, to rest together in shared presence and to touch on our collective strength, kindness, honesty, and depth. And I'd like to dedicate the merit of our practice together today to all beings across time and space, visible and invisible. Of the human and the more than human realm. And ultimately, let's all imagine giving the merit back to the earth, just sensing it dissolving into this earth. Thank you, friends. Really lovely to be here with you. You know, it's interesting. I am rarely invited to offer a two hour teaching. And I think it's such a, a lovely, short but long time to get to be together. <laughs> and I'm glad that we had an intimate group and could field uh, some of your questions today. I just want to let people know that um, if you want to go deeper, first step would be to read this book. Yeah. And as an author, I've been um, reminding people that it's super generous and helpful to authors with new books, if you ever feel called to, to leave a review for it. For people who want to go even deeper, there's a retreat in January at Esalen and Big Sur about luminous darkness. There's a year long which begins in January online, which is simply a two hour monthly gathering on the topic. Next year, there will be a number of online immersions where we'll go deeper together. And I'm still looking for the right venue to put uh, on the next darkness retreat, meaning being purely in the dark together, and I'll let you know when that 
unfolds. So one more announcement um, I realize is that at the end of this month is the application deadline for a six month training that I guide called the heart of listening and it is one of the loves of my life and something if that title intrigues you, you might want to check it out online. My understanding is that there might be a couple of announcements that Noam has or Katie. So 